Welcome to MR Conversations Beyond Leviathan. I'm Rebecca, and I'm really looking forward to this special event in honor of one of the most beloved of Marxian theorists, Isfan Bizarros, and the final of his works, Beyond Leviathan. Um, right away, we're going to get right into his book, um, but we're going to start on a personal note with some background on Mizaros by Monthly Review editor John Bellamy Foster and Attila Mede, who has been so kind as to join us from um, his native Hungary. So John, I'm going to hand it right over to you, who obviously has the very intimate knowledge of the actual paper <laughs> on which Mizaros scrawled down his ideas and, and somehow managed to shape it all into what, what reads as a very, very clear and potent book. Mezaros uh, came from, from the working class in Hungary. So it's a very unusual figure for, for one, of the, one of the leading Marxist theorists of the late 20th and, and um, early 21st century. Um, he didn't come from the bourgeoisie, he came from the working class. At age 12, he started working in a, an airplane factory, claiming that he was actually 16. He was big for his age. But uh, uh, he, because he was male, he was paid more than, than his mother who worked in the factory. And, uh, and that started off his lifelong uh, uh, hatred <laughs> and critique of, um, of uh, patriarchy and uh, the oppression of women. And uh, he, he learned very early uh, when he was working in the, the airplane factory just how exploitative capitalism was. And, uh, and uh, that uh, started off his, his, uh, his uh, dedication, his lifelong dedication to a critique of capitalism. And uh, he's an um, amazing figure because uh, well, he, he he rose to the really the top of uh, of um, Hungarian culture and philosophy. Uh, he was chosen by Lukács as as basically his heir to the the chair in aesthetics. Uh, he was uh, edited uh, well. He was very much involved in in the ideas that led to the the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 and um, from the left and. Uh, uh, he had to leave the country at that time, then taught in, in uh, Italy, and then in Scotland, and then in Sussex, and uh, uh, for a while in, in Toronto, uh, in, and, uh, which, which created an, an international controversy as the Canadian government tried to, to keep him out, uh, even though he'd already won the, the Deutsche Prize in 1971 for his uh, great work, uh, Marx's Theory of Alienation. My acquaintance with, uh, with uh, Mezros is, was really rather circuitous. I, when I, in the early 1970s, I read Marx's Theory of Alienation in college and I was really taken by it. To me, it seemed um, the only real uh, symbiosis with, uh, with Marx's own work, it seemed to uh, extend and deepen our understanding of Marx's critique. And I think that uh, I would still say there is no other work uh, that has been produced within Marxism that's so much that uh, so clearly captures Marx's fundamental theory of alienation, his ontological basis, and so on, uh, other than maybe uh, Lukács' uh, social ontology. So I went to Toronto in 1975 and visited Mezeros's class and decided I was going to go to graduate school there. I arrived in 1976 and he had left, he had left Toronto uh, for Sussex, partly because of splits within the Marxists within the department at the at York University in Toronto. And so I kind of I continued to immerse myself in Mezeros's work, but I uh, and um, along with uh, other things, but uh, I found his approach to be most the most fundamental. And uh, I didn't actually meet him until the late 1980s and early 1990s. We didn't we barely talked because 
it was at the Social Scholars Conference and it was with groups of people. And um, I didn't um, really have uh, much in the, of a relationship uh, with him until around 2000. In the 1990s, late 1990s, he was, he was very close to Harry Magdoff and Daniel Singer. They were basically, uh, they, they saw things the same. And this was during a period of transition in MR and the three of them were trying to work out a transition that would work for monthly review. And my name came up a lot. Meanwhile, I was writing uh, Marx's Ecology, I was, which was published in 2000. And I started visiting England and, uh, and uh, then there, was there were opportunities to uh, have long, long conversations with Maseros and, and also correspondence. He's really the warmest, he was the warmest person you can imagine uh, he, uh, and, and brilliant uh, in every way. The first time I had a long conversation with him, I went, went home and wrote it all down, which I've never done before or since, um, not relying on my memory. And uh, we had uh, these conversations and, uh, and correspondence and he, he um, uh, we, we had an instant rapport because we thought um, similarly about philosophy, political economy, uh, the critique of capitalism and so on. And uh, I uh, gradually became responsible for for um, you know the the future you know for his legacy and um, uh, at the time of his death I I promised that I would you know bring out uh, beyond Leviathan actually this first volume it's only it was only the first volume almost completed of Beyond Leviathan but there are actually two other volumes uh, in in early draft form and I promised I'd bring it all out so. The, the, um, the next two volumes, since they weren't completed, will be brought out together under the title uh, Beyond, no, uh, Critique of Leviathan will be the title. And, uh, but it's really an extension of this work. And uh, it, it's all in the form of handwritten notes that are, that are scattered, but I have his plan and know how to put it together, but it's going to probably take years with what all the other things I'm doing to bring it out. But I think he is um, one of the most brilliant uh, Marxist theorists of all time. It's, it would, uh, I would rank him at the top. Uh, and, uh, and yet he was this extraordinary warm uh, human being at the same time. Well, uh, I, am, I, am, I am unlucky, I've never met him. Uh, uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, there is a connection uh, through our journal called Esmir, uh, which is the only Marxist journal in Hungary, which has been going on, which was established in 1956, in the summer of 1956. And then the, the other editors uh, have always, uh, when I joined them, they immediately, before that, I did not read Mesa, uh, but they, they were talking about Mesa quite a lot. And actually, I can say that Esmeralda is very much uh, within the perspectives of Mesa in, in various key issues of critique. And that, then I had, uh, of course, I read the Beyond Capital. And then I could also see uh, some personal things. Uh, one thing which has come out already is the correspondence between Mesa and Lukács. Uh, we all know that. Uh, they were very close to each other. Even, even we published uh, his marriage photo because when Mesaros got married, the witness was uh, George Lukács. Uh, so, so that was really a very personal. And there was a long correspondence between them, which, was, which came out under the editorial of uh, Thomas Krauss and Peter Sigeti. Uh, and then in case you read this correspondence, once again, you learn a lot. Uh, First of all, you know, some key things which are very important in Sarosh, uh, his views is that, and together with Lukács as well, sometimes discussing, sometimes not really agreeing, but very close to each other. First of all, the rejection of Stalinism, uh, which was very important for him uh, and for the whole Esmilet uh, journal as well. 
also looking at uh, some kind of a tertium datur, that is to say, to find a new way out of things. That was also very important, and they were discussing these things. Plus, very interestingly, when I was reading um, Beyond Leviathan, I could see this uh, big debate because uh, Lukács was thinking about writing about ethics. And then he had, you know, various problems. I think it's a big problem. It's a big problem for, the, uh, for this book as well. And then they were discussing uh, how it's impossible to create pure ethics uh, and then how ethics should be put into this um, social framework. And it's, it's super interesting. The only thing I'm saying is that uh, I, I heard that he, he was an extremely warm person, but amazingly sharp intellectual discussions and then to get things... Um, to the right, so in that sense. And the very last personal thing is when I recognize, you know, this is when, when an East European is, is absolutely amazed. East Europeans are very happy to forget some of their best uh, persons, right? Um, and then when I visited my friends in Brazil, then I could see that everybody greeted me immediately. Okay, so tell me something about the Lukács archive plus Mesaros, and let's talk about Mesaros. And then I was, oh, I was very happy to, to do that. But that showed me also again that here is something which is, which is globally valid, which is globally interesting. So in that sense, to be honest, it makes me very proud. One more thing which I wanted to, and we talked about this, is that, uh, so he was really global. In thinking, he was completely global and universal, uh, which is a rare thing uh, nowadays. But he kept his links to Hungary and to Eastern Europe. So he was very careful. So this is what Tomasz Kroos told me very nicely. He was very careful about his name so that his name should be written as it is in Hungarian and, and not, not, not be mistaken in, in this respect. And so, so he was really somebody who maintained that. And then um, for us, East European critical persons, this is something very dear and very close. So um, I actually was corresponding with his son Giorgio recently, and he wrote, you know, I, I sincerely hope that in the longer term, the book has the impact my father intended. It will be up to others how they make use of it. One can only hope, certainly it is of the most utmost increasing relevance. And of this, I think we will all agree. So I guess uh, a starting place for this conversation will be why has this book increased in relevance? in the years after its author passed on. Uh, let's get right to it. Today's conversation will fall into three simple parts. First, we'll think about how Beyond Leviathan addresses some hitherto unresolved topics that are frankly vital to human and possibly planetary survival, specifically what the state and its withering means. Um, some basic questions we'll be sure to touch on are, you know, what is the state? We must know that in order to eradicate it. What is this withering? Um, and why must it happen? Then we'll get into thinking about the consequences of failing to commit to the withering of the state. And we'll start by applying Misha Roche to his native region of the world and think about how the failure to seek the withering of the state enabled the European and American neoliberal orders to gain the advantage. And then we'll apply Misha Roche to several nations that claim a communist or socialist basis and think about what the state and the withering of the state means in those contexts. So, um, to begin with, let's let's get into the first part of the discussion. How does this book seek to address key unresolved topics in Marxist thought regarding the state? I think that in the 21st century, this book is is super important, and it's going to be uh, it's going to produce debate because once again, the left is very much in front of the state uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I see that uh, these new waves of anti-imperialism is using uh, a non-critical view of the state in these uh, geopolitical discussions. And then uh, there's an ongoing debate. It's just the most important thing is to grab back the state. And I think in case we re read the book, nobody needs to end and, um, agree with me. But after reading the book, I find these debates more and more futile. Uh, in case uh, I read uh, the book of Mesarosh uh, carefully in this respect, I think uh, on the I think Mesarosh is able to shift our position again beyond the state. This is why the 
beyond Leviathan, so beyond the state, which is very important, that that needs to be our focus. But I'm sure that we will come back to this problem at a later point of the discussion. Well, if you read um, Beyond Leviathan, you won't find any references uh, at all uh, to um, the Marxist debates on the state in the 1960s and 1970s, most uh, famously associated with the, the uh, debate between Ralph Miliband and Nikos Palancis and all of the other contributions, none of those uh, approaches, um, none of those discussions enter into his analysis at all. Although he's um, closest uh, to Miliband's perspective, basically those debates on the state uh, were irrelevant or, or, or certainly not fundamental from his point of view, and they don't constitute uh, a Marxist theory of the state. Uh, they're, they were really the result of attempts within Eurocommunism and, and, uh, and the Labour Party in Britain to uh, figure out how socialists could come take advantage of the relative autonomy of the state, um, come to power, basically share power uh, uh, with um, elements of capital within the state. And um, and sort of reconfigure, radically reform uh, capitalist society or the capitalist state, and uh, none of this uh, is is central for Maseros. Uh, he he starts off with um, basically Norberto uh, Bobbio's uh, notion that there is no Marxist theory of the state, and uh, he also quotes you know Althusser and. Uh, and uh, uh, Coletti on that. And the reason, the reason this is so important is that um, the, um, the classical Marxist theory of the state uh, that came out of Marx himself with the critique of the Gotha program and uh, with his writings on, on the Paris uh, Commune and in, in, um, in uh, Lenin's state and revolution, it was all about the withering away of the state or how the state will wither away. And the, the problem for Marxist theory at that time classically was, was the eradication of the state. Basically, Maseros's position, Maseros's own position, is you can't transcend capital and you can't transcend labor without transcending the state as it emerged in history. But he doesn't take this um, from the standpoint of, well, then we'll just look, analyze the capitalist state. He sees the state as a structure arising um, out of um, class struggle from, from um, over thousands of years. So he goes back to Plato and Aristotle, uh, Augustine, um, Machiavelli, uh, Hobbes, Hegel, all the way up. He, he uh, passes through all the major state theorists in trying to understand how the state uh, is uh, arose, uh, what are its dimensions, and how do we, we transcend it. And this isn't some sort of utopian fantasy for him. It's um, the, the state is um, a hierarchical system of power uh, connected to the maintenance of class society. But he recognizes that all societies have to have an overall political command structure. It's just they don't you know, have to have it in the form of the state, a hierarchical class-based uh, uh, political order. And, uh, and going deeply into how that evolved historically, its contradictions and, and um, the, the means for its transcendence is what Beyond Leviathan is all about. Now, this may seem like an enormous project, but then uh, it may seem to some to be almost irrelevant because the, the capitalist state is everywhere. But the point is that um, theoretically, you can't actually have a, a Marxist critique unless you can 
step outside the system. Uh, and Marx's critique is based on stepping out of um, the capital relation. It also involves stepping out of the alienated labor relation, but it also requires that we uh, step out of the, the state uh, relation, which holds the system together. The modalities of capital consists of capital, labor, and the state. And they reinforce each other. And you have to uh, basically eradicate all three. Eradicating labor means eradicating alienated labor. And uh, you have to eradicate all three to transcend capitalism. And you have to create a new social metabolism in its place with a new uh, form of a new political command structure in order to be able to develop um, a critique a revolutionary response in order to be able to actually talk about how we create a society of substantive equality. And then we can fight um, the struggle on the ground as, as it is, but with this wider, more radical, more revolutionary perspective in mind, it changes strategically how we operate and um, how we conceive of a transition away from the system. So this is basically the premise of, of Beyond Leviathan. It has a lot of elements in it that, that grew out of uh, his work Beyond Capital. Its nature is universal, not restricted to particular sphere, for instance, finance or uh, a particular branch of industry. So it's universal. This never happened in history. Now, its scope is global, not confined to particular countries. Number three, its time scale is extended, continuous, permanent, not cyclic. Now, finally, the mode of unfolding is creeping, not uh, violent, although the, the violent uh, modality cannot be excluded either. When we are talking about a feasible alternative, which has to come, we are talking about a deepening of the uh, democratic processes, not an elimination of the democratic uh, conditions. On the contrary, a, a transformation of the, these processes into substantive processes. When we talk about equality, we also mean the substantive equality. So there are all sorts of, of concepts involved, uh, the most important being substantive equality. But um, the basic framework is how do we understand uh, the problem of transcending the state? And how does that inf inform our, our everyday practice, rather than taking the liberal uh, conception of the state, which is circular and based on a kind of lawlessness and, um, and just trying to reconfigure that, uh, that, that goes nowhere. Uh, we, we need a more revolutionary uh, theoretical critique in, in his view. Bourgeois state, the capitalist state claims to be based on law it's, it's, it's actually um, very dependent on lawlessness. That is all sorts of constant exceptions uh, that uh, maintain the power that break with any rule of law. So be, behind the facade of law is this, this uh, realm of lawlessness now, if you have this spontaneous and uh, uh, invisible hand kind of uh, regulating the social metabolism, what do you have? What do you need the gunboats for? And that also meant that that uh, a few countries which had the gunboats could impose their powers on the others. What about the rest? And the story, the state of the world today, tells you what about the rest? How they were developed as a consequence? That is all part of this adversarial system, which has to be turned into a cooperative system. So that's, that's, uh, then, of course, you can also attend to the question of the state, because 
the way in which the state functions is, of course, necessarily related to, to the adversarial nature of the system. There is a very important message in this book, which comes back again and again. State is uncontrollable. Uh, as a historical product, is uncontrollable. Uh, nation states are uncontrollable. And uh, nation states are also not only internally uncontrollable, but externally is un uncontrollable. Controllable. Also, very importantly, it, there's a very gloomy message that war is built into the system. That war is not an accident in this, but war is built into the system. So in that sense, it is a very uh, uh, gloomy picture, uh, but in terms of historical analysis, very important uh, because it helps Mesaros to develop. And this is what he, he does in Beyond Capital as well. He goes into very detailed specific cases when he start to you know, analyze this. But the point of Mesarush is, is not that, not just a capitalist state is a problem. The state in non-capitalist systems is also a problem. And actually it can uh, make things uh, much worse. So this is why we need to take this very seriously. And this is why the current debates are super important. We have seen examples where when the capitalist state has been overthrown and it remained an extremely fragile situation. Uh, the, instead of withering away of the state, as Marx anticipated, no steps were they taken in that direction, no steps could be taken in that direction. Uh, it is feasible, but of course not feasible in isolated bits. It's only feasible if they, there is a strategy envisaging this kind of transformation, and that strategy is implemented by forces which themselves are capable of doing, not the political el elites which run our life. One of the problems is that um, the path um, the path beyond the state or the path to, to uh, the withering a way of the state passes through the state. So it's not, it's not possible to simply, to, uh, simply um, say, well, the state's going to wither away. There is actually an immediate struggle over the state and, um, and uh, that struggle has, has dominated the left. And there's, um, there are, and uh, if you don't have a, a long-term strategic perspective, you can even um, uh, supposedly gain control of the state and, um, and uh, fall into a trap um, because you end up simply reinforcing the capital relation. So uh, the two dominant strategies uh, of the left in the, in the, you know, in the 20th century, so we're, of course, the the uh, Soviet model, uh, which you know became actually um, a very centralized uh, state, and um, well, it didn't start out exactly like that, but be, um, and and the other was the social democratic uh, model pursued uh, by the left in the West, and part of um, Mazeros's work is involved uh, with explaining why both of those failed. So uh, Beyond Capital is really a very large part of Beyond Capital is, is about why um, the Soviet type societies failed and the capital relation persisted um, in, and, uh, and, in many, and in many respects, the labor relation um, persisted in, in the Soviet Union through um, the model of a very centralized state. So the, uh, he critiques that. He, he, also, he also, in his analysis, explains why the social democratic model collapsed and, and uh, went in the direction of, of um, neoliberalism. But all this is also tied up with the structural crisis of capital, which provides the basis for for um, more revolutionary approaches. For us, uh, East Europeans, why this withering away has withered away, unfortunately, 
was exactly what, what John has already mentioned, but let, let me come back to this a little bit because it shows the point of Nesaros perfectly. So the problem is not only that, that uh, uh, during the 1920s uh, in the Soviet Russia and then in the Soviet Union, there was a dramatic shift over state control, uh, which is Stalinism, but very importantly, and not only that, that later point, the socialist experience uh, could be hardly rescued out of this, right? Regardless of the thing that history was going on, socialism didn't stop, it went beyond Stalinism, but it was in some ways trapped, most importantly, on the side of the state. So the state uh, could not, so th this was, you know, one of the last messages of not just Mitzvah, but Lukács was exactly this. In case you do not democratize economy, you do not go down to workers control, you don't do these things, you will be finished. And history is proving both them right for a very simple reason. For instance, state ownership or state control maintained uh, over the economy was actually the weak point through which the whole uh, project could be finished. So the privatization and going into the neoliberal era was very easy because basically the, the state had just had to declare that I'm privatizing a whole lot of things. And then here you go. And then we, then we can finish this very sw uh, swiftly and quickly. I think there's a lot of confusion about neoliberalism. So just let me say a few words about that and Mazeroz's um, attitude towards that. I mean, the, the, the term neoliberalism was, was um, coined in the 1920s between, uh, between the First and Second World War by, um, by Austrian by Austrian socialists, um, uh, you know, Alfred Mussel particularly, in a critique of, um, of um, Ludwig von Mies, uh, Mises uh, and, um, and Friedrich Hayek, who actually represent um, the, the, the core foundations of neoliberalism. And uh, that, that debate, um, sort of disappeared in the context of the Second World War. And then in the 1970s, uh, when the structural crisis of, of a capital, as Mazeros explains, began, they, um, they uh, right uh, resurrected neoliberal uh, views. And neoliberalism from the very beginning, and it was understood, Foucault understood this too, neoliberalism has to do with eliminating the relative autonomy of the state by making the state and all sub all um, state organs and public organs, uh, uh, making them subjecting them to to uh, the processes of the market, um, and uh, privatization goes along with that. But that's not even the most important thing. The, the, because the state it, it retained remains intact in many ways under neoliberalism, but it means that the state has to operate according to the principles of, of the capitalist market. So it can no longer operate in a rel relatively autonomous way um, according to its own principles. And, this is a, a manifestation of the structural crisis of capital that's been going on globally and that has um, uh, you know, developed since, uh, you know, over the last uh, half century. There's a kind of withering away of the, of the state within neoliberalism only. It's withering away of, of the autonomy of the state while the state still is there to reinforce capitalist processes and even become subject to it. And for Mazeros, the critical problem, this arose uh, in his analysis in two ways. One was the, the demise of the Labour Party, particularly with you know, Tony Blair, but, but before that, so that the Labour Party simply became a neoliberal party and social democracy completely di dissolved um, 
uh, following primarily neoliberal principles with um, with a with a smile uh, rather than a frown. Market socialism, that is something in which I certainly cannot believe in for a moment. In fact, before, well before, nearly 10 years before the collapse of the uh, Soviet system, when uh, people in the East were advocating uh, the market socialist way of uh, resolving the problems of their society. And incidentally, they were advocating uh, the introduction of the labor market and the right of corporations uh, to go bankrupt. That is to say, the, the introduction of laws through which uh, corporations or, or state enterprises could, could go bankrupt, etc., etc., all led in the direction, of course, of, uh, they argued in the, uh, through this, the benefits of, of the market uh, socialist system could be introduced and will live happily ever after. Now, what happened? The opposite has happened. The whole system collapsed. To the, uh, the, to the collapse of the, of the system, this contributed enormously. And, and in those days, when in the er, uh, early uh, stages of, of this process, uh, early, uh, well, the 70s, late 70s, early, early 80s, I wrote that instead of the benefits of this, what they were dreaming about, instead of the de benefits they were ex expecting, what they will have, the certainty of mass unemployment. That's the only thing they could get out of it. And indeed, they got it. Okay? So that is how, of course, the logic of capital imposes itself. And uh, market socialism can only be characterized as, as a fantasy. And I, I even used a, a very good English saying, if pigs had wings, <laughs> they would fly. Now, if the market had wings, socialist wings, it could fly. But I don't think it does. Uh, uh, pigs have big nose, and they need the trough at a very low level uh, so they can feed themselves for it. And, and therefore, the logic of this adversarial system, you know, that is, of course, very much concerned with uh, the, the market, uh, whatever form it is, it is concerned with uh, the necessity of, of uh, clashes and collapses and confrontations. That's why I think it is incompatible. Uh, the, uh, the market socialist fa fantasy is, is unrealizable. And uh, I understand that, that at, at certain stages of, of theoretical debates, people uh, throw it up uh, and again introduce and say, well, perhaps our society here would be better if the market acquired a conscience. Uh, they were talking about the social market, the social market with the heart, okay? But that is really the wing on the pigs. Uh, there is no, no chance of, of a, a social heart because it is, it is ferociously uh, confronting one another. If you are then trying to introduce the notion of an overall control over this market, then of course you have to give up uh, the idea of, of its very nature. The idea, uh, again, well before uh, I even heard the, the word uh, Gorbachev, I, I was uh, arguing that um, the, those who advocate this kind of, of system, that uh, yes, we allow it to, to function, but we will control it. So when the logic of capital prevails and imposes itself, you control it. That is to say, you undermine what is efficient in it. It undermines the buying dynamics or, or, or you destroy it altogether. This is how I see the difficulties, the impossibility of reconciling the two principles. The only thing that that kind of introduction of the market principle into the, the, the socialist system could be is to restore capitalism, to trend to the, the, towards the dis, uh, restoration of capitalism. And therefore, I, I, I cannot take seriously today more seriously uh, than in the past. If anything, we have to remember the historical experience of what happened. The moment the process was started and the moment these laws were passed in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe, the whole system collapsed and imploded.
And that should be a reminder for those who, who advocate the idea of market socialism. In Latin America, neoliberalism was, impo was imposed in the most extreme ways. And of course, um, I mean, it was really the, the trial um, because of US dominance, it was uh, Latin America was the, the experimental region for neoliberalism and uh, Venezuela, uh, Venezuela's revolution actually was a response to that. The place where uh, Maseros had the most impact, of course, was on, on Chavez in Venezuela, where, um, where very much, um, a large part of the Bolivarian revolution under Chavez's leadership was modeled after uh, Maseros's ideas. So there, uh, the, the idea, at least with while Chavez was in charge, was, was Yes, for the have a a state that rep, um, that was um, subject to popular sovereignty, but also that uh, dissolved um, uh, much of the, the state power and and um, handed that over to the communities or in, in to the the communes. So it involved in 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 some ways gaining the state so that the state could be. Uh, or political command structure could be re restructured away from a classic state model. And that was actually very effective. Um, uh, Mesero said, you have to make a revolution irreversible. And how do you do that? That's by giving the power to the people. And Chavez uh, also represented that. It was very, very effective. You can see how effective it was given the, um, the power that the United States has exerted to destroy that revolution and, uh, and the resistance of the population. That kind of resistance only exists when there's a, a, a degree of irreversibility. That is, people are not willing to give up uh, what they gained as a result of the revolution, even under the most extreme conditions. And this is, um, you know, this is part of this same, you know, theoretical understanding. So the problem is that, yeah, you can't simply, um, beyond Leviathan has to be the goal, but to, but to uh, institute that, uh, you have to confront the state directly and even um, in, and even gain popular sovereignty over the state in order to be able to affect the changes. Uh, so it's, it's a complex process. You know, this was so absurd about the whole mythology of modernization, you know, that we, we were projecting models of the American type society, which if it is generalized or universalized would would mean the destruction of humanity tomorrow. So Miserich is doing a historical analysis as we have already spoken about this. And he's carefully analyzing the failure of the state in capitalism. And here there is a lot of misunderstanding. Generally, when people speak about failed states, then they go to Africa and they point at, you know, let's say Mali. Mali is a failed state because it's unable to answer. Mizaro says the opposite. He says the real failure of the state is in the core countries uh, because of the financialization, because of the debt problems. So they are uh, because of uh, their inefficiency in intervening in maintaining uh, the stability of the economy and so on and so on. Uh, so that's the, really the failure. And then this we need. That's very important because this is a historical development. So this is the structural crisis of capital. This is what he's talking about all the time. And then we have to take this, of course, ecological thing. The state is unable to handle these things. Most importantly, the very rich states are not able to, to handle these things, right? So he's, he's not doing this blaming game toward the poor, uh, toward, toward the so-called undeveloped, but to the very developed. Right? And then he says, this is a failure. And this is unavoidable. That is to say, he doesn't see a way out of this. Also, very importantly, he is not a fan of 
global state. So he makes it very clear that in the current conditions, it's impossible to create some kind of a global state and that even that would not be a solution because that would not be able, able to handle all the contradictions which emerge globally. So even he says that would be a some kind of, of a nightmare scenario in some ways um, because you know not being able to handle the contradiction. Plus very importantly, he's pessimistic in terms of wars and destruction. And these things have to be taken very seriously when we do historical analysis because you know, Marxist analysis is not about really some kind of a utopia. You think about something nice and then you start talking about, oh yeah, let's leave it in another way. The question is, which way are we going? And this is what he's asking. So one of the things what's going to answer the, the thing, what uh, this state is going to lose is, the state is going to lose its capacity to, to, to operate and uh, during these processes which is not a theoretical question as such, but a practical question. So one example, which is not in the book, but look at migration. I mean, they are unable to handle uh, in uh, legal frameworks, uh, uh, the various uh, you know, movements of people among states, which is actually one of the things uh, which is very important because it's symptomatic that is unable to handle. So, we could see the migrant crisis um, because of the Syrian war and because of Iraq and then uh, because of Africa and so on. But now we see what is going on in the US all the time, uh, continuously. And then you just can't say that it is one administration is doing badly and the other one is doing nicely. No, all of them are doing very badly because they are unable to handle this uh, question. So Mr. in this book is not writing about migration, but I can freely offer to anybody to think it over uh, that this is also part of, you know, the, this overall structural crisis which is going on, and uh, how it's, and also it shows how not there is no global state, uh, there is uh, no no global regulation which is able to operate. The crisis of the state is actually centered in the advanced capitalist world, and uh, it's no longer able to uh, function. And we, you know, we're going to be forced to uh, transcend it. It can't solve the environmental problem. It can't solve uh, the economic problem. In, and uh, it can't solve the problem of, of the of, um, world war, the, the increasing dangers of uh, a thermonuclear exchange. Uh, and the system becomes more and more corrupt. And, um, and extends to the media system and everything else. And uh, the only um, possibility is, is to move away from the state uh, structure towards a different kind of political system. And the, um, it has to involve, um, the, it has to involve increased sovereignty from below. I think Mazeros doesn't have a single model, although Venezuelan model sort of came out of his analysis, but he doesn't believe that there's only one single path in which the state can be transformed. It does require, it does require um, uh, taking a lot of the state power and, and, um, and passing that to the people. So the state, um, the state um, uh, it begins to to wither away while the while the uh, political command structure is strengthened at the bottom of society. Um, but this is a long transition. He doesn't he doesn't um, uh, depict a single path. Mizanovich is, is also clear about this idea of substantive equality. Uh, he is not hiding. Uh, what kind of uh, things he expect as an outcome of historical development, right? So he's talking about, you know, how a new system can be built on the capacity of workers, the need of the consumers, the actual needs, not the symbolic needs, and so the actual needs of consumers, the equality of pleasure and play, how to freely allocate our working time, uh, and then uh, what is how to socialize disposable time and so on and so on. So it's very clear about the thing when there is no need for a state. 
uh, in his understanding. And I think that's very important because he says that there is always, as John said, that there is a common structure, but the common structure has to be related to these systems. In case uh, he says that capital is finished, which is based on you know, the minimum uh, socially necessity, uh, necessary time for, for production and so on and so on. In case we are over this, then we can have a different commanding structure, which is built on, on another metabolic system. So he's not saying that there is no common structure. He says that it's not going to be the state uh, as we understood it in, in, in the long run. So at least this is my understanding. You have a system of institutionalized irresponsibility that the consequences cannot be, can, cannot be assumed by anybody. So the socialist system, if it has any chance of functioning, it has to be a system of responsibility. People who are working, realizing their potential, their ability, they have to work, uh, they have to take responsibility for their deeds, for their actions. And they will be only too happy to do that if they are in control of their, their own situation. In the Latin American uh, in revolutions or the Latin American transformations that have been going on uh, up, up and down uh, against uh, neoliberalism, one of the things that, um, that makes a difference and made a difference in Chavez is that they rewrite their constitutions. They have constituent assemblies and the people re rewrite the constitutions to make them more democratic, uh, which is what happened in Venezuela to give the, the population more power. And um, this is, this is um, shifting um, uh, away from the hierarchical framework of the state and that's important in the transition. Venezuela is super important because this idea of communes is actually politically so progressive that this is most probably the only good thing I've, I've seen in the 21st century up to now. Because it is exactly about the thing that it is trying to move things in a way that the state is, is getting under some control so that, that somehow the system change can be uh, picked up sooner or later, although at the moment just politically. And then we have to see this uh, experiment and let's say the experiment of China with a whole lot of things from the point of view of state. So today's Marxists have an enormously important thing to solve on the basis of Mesaros as well, to evaluate comparatively uh, the current experiments where there is an attempt to somehow to control capitalism, to move beyond capitalism, and finally to beyond uh, capital, right? Which is very important to Mesaros. But I think, this is what we need to, to look at uh, carefully. And to be honest, I am very uh, pessimistic in a lot of ways in the short run, uh, because I think, uh, let's say, and then let's talk about this. I think what's, what's going on in China, it is showing some of the key traps that Ms. Arush is talking about. Uh, and just I give you just one very simple example for the sake of discussion. In case, um, and this was actually uh, the point of Lukács as well, in case you have a, a, a mixed economy in the sense that one part is capitalist, the other part is not. How you are, what kind of an antagonisms are there which you have to overcome and the, what the state has to solve? And then the state is uh, seeing these contradictions. For instance, the rise of large scale capital in China what can it do? And then, you know, this uh, uh, regulating, commanding these different systems, for instance, in my view, is an easy way toward authoritarian rule and an authoritarian state in that respect. Once again, I'm just asking, because I think this is why we need to read beyond Leviathan and think over this question together with Ishtar Misa because we need to, to give good answers to this. Uh, and I hope that this book is going to help a lot in this respect. Venezuela is subject to um, the system of modern siege warfare, 
um, where its its base its assets have been seized. It's it's under blockade. Uh, the a, a case of lawlessness is you know the the um, and they're they're actually seizing Venezuelan personnel, breaking with international law, and putting them in U.S. prisons. You know the um, it's um, it's been subject to to coup attempts. It's um, organized by the United States. This is the full force of imperial power, everything short of direct military intervention. And we don't know that that won't happen. Uh, has, has, so you can't really talk about political de-evolution de of the Venezuelan state. I mean, they, they basically have kept intact um, the, the communes and, and, but they, under the pressures that they're in, uh, under they uh, they have very limited options, and so it's um, and and they're isolated. So um, you you know as as uh, as Major said, um, this isn't going to be solved um, on a. There can't be a a um, um, socialism in one one country alone. Uh, there has to be. It has to be part of uh, global alliances. A country that's under this kind of imperial pressure is is not going to look uh, like a country that actually had its its own destiny fully under its control. And yet, um, they haven't been able to break the Venezuelan revolution. They haven't even been able to break it at the level of, you know, it's still being supported politically by the population because uh, there's something irreversible about it uh, that uh, it gave so much to the population that even with the kind of pressure that's being um, posed on them, they're not willing to, to uh, abandon it. What we need to analyze in the case of Venezuela as well, yes, we have an alternative common structure. Uh, which is uh, original in a lot of ways, uh, and so on and so on. You need to understand what is going to be the dynamics of this. That, that's, the, that's the major question. Just like 100 years in Soviet Russia. It's not the question is what compromises you make or what would, the question is the dynamics of the development. And then of course, uh, we, all, we are all very eager to learn what is how the, the, the Venezuelan state and the communes coexist, and then what it means in a scenario which has already been uh, described by John very well, uh, and so on, in, in, under a dramatic pressure. And then how it, but nonetheless, we have to step back and then we have to see what is going to be the then, then we know something more about whether this revolutionary change can be maintained or not. Right? And that's also the case with every other examples all around the world. Because that's, I think, what, what Mesaro should support to have a dynamic analysis of that. He sees it as a long struggle. He doesn't see it as, you know, him, there's some sort of immediate um, solution to these problems. Uh, the, even in case of Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution, he said to Chavez, you will fail, right? Because no one country can can uh, solve these problems. The solutions have to be global. And at the very end of Chavez's life, and uh, he and and Mesros were working on on trying to create a, a new uh, a call for a new international, as they called it globally, that would would um, try to create a global response, which is for him is necessary. And of course, I love um, Atia's notion that. The key to Meseros is that he's more historical, more universal, more global, and uh, more revolutionary in his standpoint. Uh, the problem isn't um, the problem is that uh, the changes didn't go deep enough, and uh, and um, in all of these um, attempts that have been made. One more sentence to this: it's, it's in addition to it's not just self-governance or this uh, direct uh, democracy and so. It also depends on what kind of a material reproduction is going on, because that's that's something very important. So, so the key point of Mr. Rush is, is not that we get rid of the state, because he's always arguing in case you just want to cut the state, it's going to come back. Right? So the point is that in case uh, uh, this material reproduction is based on the different system, 
then it can have a different uh, common structure. Uh, in that. And if the two things are not developing somehow together, then, then the answer is, is very easy. There is not going to be a known state, but the state is going to come back uh, sooner or later. Right? Something is not uh, happening in, 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 in the sphere of the material reproduction. I think that's, that's what, what, what very simply Nisarosh would, would, would uh, answer to this. Uh, we tend to um, talk as though the existing institutions, the existing state is stable and that you know, so and that it's it's stable and fairly permanent, and uh, that revolution has to simply go after this stable permanent structure of capitalism. The truth is, in you know this structural crisis of capital that Maseros talks about, things are are falling apart. It is not. We do not have stable institutions now. You can look at. The environmental problem, it's not even clear that humanity won't destroy itself um, this century, right? Um, uh, particularly from environmental, um, um, you know, the um, climate change and crossing other planetary boundaries, but also thermonuclear war. There's nothing stable. We have um, neoliberalism is, is, is creating a kind of rot in the society that is pervasive and um, and um, we have um, uh, 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 economic stagnation has dominated in the uh, in the advanced capitalist world for about half a century now very slow growth in which capitalism can't really um, maintain itself except by by um, basically uh, capital uh, taking larger slices of the pie. Um, mean by means of financialization. So we have all of these these problems. Imperialism is in many ways in crisis. There's a geopolitical uh, crisis globally, and um, there's nothing really stable about this. It's actually in many ways uh, falling apart. The state um, then has to uh, be replaced, and there will be struggles, um, massive struggles globally. Hundreds of millions of people are going to be involved. With the, the environment of the world is falling apart, um, environmental conditions. And uh, the question is, what kind of uh, an order are we going to create? One that, um, that uh, follows the traditional lines of the state or goes against it. In terms of the irreversible revolution, it's irreversible of revolution, that's the key. That's why how you uh, define a revolution uh, with uh, the Paris Commune, uh, uh, they, you know, they died in mass uh, defending their revolution. And, uh, or if you, you look at um, the conditions of Venezuela today, the, the population continues to support the Bolivarian process, Chavez, with, with um, almost the whole world uh, stacked against them. And yet the irreversible ability lies in the fact that the population has more control, um, population in general has more control over their lives, their communities, um, the way their food is organized the, or about distribution, even in the context of the blockade than they did um, under uh, the neoliberal order that preceded it. So their irreversibility is just about um, uh, being able to defend it. I remember talking to Mazeros about how Chavez handed out um, arms to almost the entire population, to the, to the com uh, communal councils, the Bolivarian circles and communes, and created this massive militia. You can't do that. You, couldn't, you can't do that in a society that doesn't have the support of the people. They were prepared to to defend their revolution in the case of um, of an of an invasion, and that's kind of irreversibility. Um, they there was no fear that they would use these arms against um, against the um, the kind of state that existed then, which was geared towards transferring po power to the population. If you look at China, and there's a big struggle taking place in China today, we don't know where it's going, but it's still a post-revolutionary society. 
we could, um, I think that it's important to not see it in monolithic terms, uh, but there are, um, you know, aspects of, of uh, China where they are able to enlist the population, not in an authoritarian manner, really, but um, genuinely um, enlist the, the population in, say, for example, in, in dealing with COVID, that's completely impossible uh, in a state like uh, the United States, where um, there is no coherence at the bottom of society, no basis of, of coherent social movements, and there can't be a mass line in the U.S. society, because in, in fact, under capital, it's extremely authoritarian. And uh, they can't, in, in this society, they can't actually mobilize the population because they're afraid of the population. So this is, um, irreversibility is really a question of to what extent is a sovereignty, a popular sovereignty, and it's, is it something that people are going to defend, whether there's some level of constituent power in the society. And, um, and the more you, you give to the population, the more it's harder to take it away from them. Uh, if they, if um, if there was a coup in Venezuela, um, you know, which would be engineered by the United States, people would would struggle against it in mass, because because um, they they would defend the gains that they've experienced. Um, uh, as a result of the Bolivarian process, just that's why um, that's why it persists um, despite all the problems. Similar, you know, there's similar situation in Cuba, a very different situation, but there is very very strong popular support in the society. Yeah. Uh, may I just add uh, a, a short uh, thing today? So, so. Well, what makes change permanent in, in certain directions? One is that, very importantly, the new models, they have to be alive already. There's no such thing as something comes into being without being in already there. Uh, so it means that uh, that's very important. And then this is why it's very important to concentrate on these new models of, uh, economic reproduction, which are key in a lot of ways for a whole lot of questions. This is one. The second, we've already spoken about this, is the failure of uh, the structural crisis of uh, capital and the failure and the structural crisis of the state as, as John did. Very important. It has to be paralyzed in some ways. It has to, it can happen in various ways. It can be an ecological catastrophe which they are unable to handle. We have already seen natural disasters nowadays cause dramatic challenges for governments to handle, right? So they can be paralyzed that the failure of uh, these actors is super important. And then comes very importantly, what has already been discussed here widely is, is movement. Movements which are able to push uh, these things. I think in case somebody would ask me, whether social change you know, on such a dramatic level is going to be permanent or going to be irreversible. These are the things it make that. Uh, any of, without any of these, I think uh, the situation is, 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 is much worse. Uh, next thing possible, right, uh, in, in some ways. Um, it's a very important question. Uh, and, uh, this is why we have to have very sharp eyes, what's really going on, right? This, this is why we need to start this debate on, on the state very soon. Well, he actually relies a lot on, on utop utopian thinkers. Um, he writes a lot about um, uh, utopian thinkers, the great utopian thinkers like um, um, like Moore and Tomasius and uh, and uh, and others in in um, beyond Leviathan and uh, what he you know utopia means is is was a a word that was coined by Moore to mean it had a it was a, a it was kind of a pun right 
because utopia means both uh, good place and no place. And, uh, and Mesero's, uh, you know, focuses on that and, and uh, you, you, you want to, to um, and you want to have a re revolutionary conception of a good place. And uh, the problem with utopia from a Marxist perspective is if it doesn't, um, if it doesn't address the, the means, if it doesn't address the, the class means of change, the historical means of change, if it doesn't focus on reality, in historical reality in the process of, of, um, of conceiving of change. But we, but um, to uh, shut off the 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 um, uh, notion of of going beyond the system is to to give up the, the game altogether. It's um, I remember Paul Sweezy once wrote an article criticizing uh, John Kenneth Grau Galbraith. He called it utopian reformism, and Sweezy argued that there was nothing more than ut nothing more utopian. In, in the negative sense than, than thinking that you could preserve the present capitalist order and, and uh, have something good out of it. Um, that we, you know, this order is crumbling before our eyes. It's threatening the very existence of humanity, um, not just through, through thermonuclear warfare as before, but, but um, within decades, um, we could undermine the whole basis of, uh, of uh, human existence on earth. And to somehow see this as permanent or stable or, or good or utopian, that's an, or, or that you could reform it and create uh, um, uh, anything um, out of it um, is, would be utopian reformism. So what is, of course, utopia is, uh, is something which is not built into the historical development. So Right, everything has a utopias can play a role in this development. That's for sure. Uh, but utopia is so any new society has to come out of history. This is so crystal clear that in case we forget it, then we forget everything. Right. So that that's that's one thing. The second is, which I was at least the the message I got from Miss Saros was this whole idea of ethical human rights, formerly equal states, as, as, as John put it very nicely, I can just repeat it, but that was what came up. That's a utopia. Actually, Karl Mannheim called this liberal humanitarian utopia. I think he was correct in that sense. So Mannheim was correct in, in um, talking about this thing. So in case we think that uh, these rights and ethics, which are, uh, spoken about can be maintained in the current situation, then we are in a problem. The only thing that we should not forget this. So Ms. Arush is actually very positive in this. So you should be aware of this in order to save humanity. Uh, because that, that's, that's you know, the trick uh, in that sense. In case you are not aware of this, then you are making a gross mistake uh, in this whole thinking. And I think this is what we should do. We should not allow this mistake uh, uh, to happen, that we don't understand that these states are not going to fulfill the ideals they are preaching to us every day. Not just because there is bad will or bad personnel, but structurally in impossible. And that's, that's, I think, is something which I think is important and makes our task even tougher uh, makes her even more responsible in case you read Ms. Saros carefully. That's well, uh, I mean, this is volume one, and volume two and three were going to be even more su substantial. Most of he has a discussion of uh, Hobbes and Hegel, who he considers to be the two greatest modern theories of the state in Beyond Leviathan, but the bulk of his analysis of, of um, Hobbes and Hegel's approaches to the state 
And therefore, you know, the really deep uh, theory of the state is actually in, in the second and third um, volume, um, you know, drafts, which, which um, are, were only, they were a second draft and not the, the final draft. So, and with that, he's able to kind of go forward more and, and talk about uh, uh, how the, not only how the bourgeois state works, but, but how to uh, transcend it. So it is, you know, it, in some ways, um, this is the Beyond Leviathan is, um, it's, it's fairly complete. Um, it was, you know, some of the chapters were missing if the, of this volume we've just published. And some of it had to be taken out of the notes, but it's um, it's incomplete in the sense that the second and third volumes where he was going to develop the argument are not are not there yet. So um, I'm, you know, critique of Leviathan will will um, make that available. I, I just wanted to say that um, I feel clumsy. Some these are such uh, broad questions, and try to answer it and explain things maybe a little bit too rapidly. Uh, the um, this is is um, extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinarily important work, and uh, I think the value of our discussion here is if it gets you interested enough to read. Mazeros for yourself, uh, if and um, and maybe to to look for uh, these answers in it, but um, I think that he has not he has not received uh, enough recognition in the English speaking world. His his books in Latin America, you know, are are um, have been translated and written in English, but translated and sold in the hundreds of thousands, even millions, and. Uh, and in, in the left in, in the United States and um, in, the, in the English speaking world, his work is hardly known. I think that that has to change. I think this is the, the um, most provocative work in Marxist theory, certainly related to the state, but also um, in terms of going beyond capital that we have, and we should be studying it and discussing it. And uh, I'm I'm excited that this seems to be happening finally. And uh, I only wish it, it had happened while he was still alive. And if there is a socialist transformation, it has to return uh, to those objectives which human beings require, it, that, that is to say, it has to negate the reduction of human beings to the condition of simple personification of labor power. The workers are also human beings. Uh, I dare say even the capitalists are human beings, but they don't exist as human beings. It's, it's not only that the workers don't exist as human beings in this setup, the capitalists don't exist as human beings. They exist as the personification of capital. And that is to say the imperatives which go with it. And that's what we have to pursue. The idea that there is an alternative. And the alternative can be mapped out. The objectives can be clearly defined. The constitution of the system which can match and infinitely improve the characteristics of the existing system. And that's where I want, would like to conclude. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye.